Good. Now, um, as far as uh, prayer requests we go on, we've got to be in prayer uh, for the young people this weekend. They have their uh, meeting, and uh, so we need to be in prayer for uh, Phil, who will be teaching, and uh, uh, the others that are there. So let's be in prayer for them. Let's be in prayer for uh, Bobby, uh, Terry's uh, brother, and uh, he's the best thing that we said. It is. It is getting better. Slow, but better. So let's so What's the matter with him? Uh oh, he was in a major uh, collapse, uh, fall with a uh, tor tornado. Why oh, didn't know that? Yeah, oh, tornado uh -huh. completely took him completely out and uh, busted up his leg, his body real bad. Oh. And uh, they, uh, they okay. didn't know about what they were going to be doing for a while, but now they've at least got it going a little bit. And then please be in prayer for my wife, and she continues dealing with things. And uh, let's be in prayer. Kit will be traveling so this weekend, so let's be in prayer for Kit and his wife and uh, sister. And um, so long list of prayers for you. <laughs> uh, I, so let's uh, get ready for our study tonight. Let's be in prayer. How grateful we are, Heavenly Father, for the Word of God, the book of Hebrews about Jesus Christ. What a great book in the Word. We pray your Spirit will open our eyes to things, encourage us in learning about Jesus Christ. Father, we pray these things in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Okay, we have now moved to Hebrews Four, four, one chapter one verse four, uh, verse three uh, ends with the power of Jesus over sins and how He sat down at the right hand of God. So let's just read the Bible in those uh, first three chapters, the uh, first three verses. God, after He spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions. And in many ways, in these last days, they're talking about the last days of the Old Testament, has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. Now, I tell you right now, what I learned most, the entire book of Hebrews, the first chapter of Hebrews, is about creation. We're going to go in. I could spend the next uh, six months, but we won't. But it is just so powerful how much is in it on creation. Now, verse 3, chapter 1. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power when he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So this is just an unbelievable chapter, a verse in above its own self. Now, verse 4 begins with uh, the superior superiority of the angels. And uh, they, you learn a great deal about angels here, more, probably more than we ever have in any one read, reading. One study. So here, let's take a look now in verse 4. Verse 4, having become as much better than the angels, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty of my, having become as much better than the angels. Now, verses 4 through 14, verse through 4, 14, manifest the facts, uh, the fact of the greatness of the Son over angels. The word angels occurs 11 times in the first two chapters of Hebrews. 
11 times in the chapter two, first two chapters of Hebrews. He is the fulfillment of the angelic conflict. So now let's go to verse four. <clears throat> Having become as much better than the angels, as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. So he is better than the angels, more excellent name than they have. Now, by taking the heir's tense of Ginnabai is to be translated with the causal because, because being made, so it's a causal, because being made so much better than the angels as he is inherited a more excellent name than they. His name is the Lord, or not just the, but then his name is Lord. Authority emphasized. Jesus, that Savior, which comes from the Hebrew Yeshua, which means Jehovah saves, or Savior. Christ emphasizes Messiah, the Anointed One. Son of God emphasizes his deity. So we have Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, all in one name. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God. His superiority over the angels is now declared by his relationship with the Father. Verses 5 through 14, we have the proof of his superiority over the angels. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 5 begins with a series of rhetorical questions to illustrate the superiority of Christ. Note again the superiority of the rhetorical questions. For to which, that's your first one, for to which of the angels did he say, you are my son? Today I have fathered you. And again, I will be, again, he's asked this in rhetorical question, I will be a father to him, and he will be the son of me. Now he began with Jesus, lower than angels, but became superior to the angels. Got to remember that now. Uh, he began in his creation and his uh, uh, birth, Lower than angels. In his humanity. Huh? In his humanity. In his humanity. Okay. Lower than angels. But with his work on the cross and the subsequent resurrection, he is superior to the angels. So this is where we are. The absolute status of Christ. You are my son. This is what he asked. The incarnation today. I have fathered you. Affirmation, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. So the absolute status of Christ, you are my son. The incarnation, today I have, today I have fathered you, and the, the affirmation, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. Now, we come and we, we compare him to angels. We come now to verse six. We're going to, let me just tell you right up front. I'm, I'm just going to be so excited at the end of the day when we're through. We're going to complete chapter one. We're going to get chapter one done. So that next week we'll be at chapter two. All right. So here's verse six. And when he again, brings the first whole, firstborn into the world. Now, what does that mean first or again? And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, this is a reference to the second advent. He says, and let all the angels of God worship him. He is for his victory. 
in the angelic conflict. Now, by the way, as I go through this, if you got any questions, please feel free to ask me. Now, verse 7. On the one hand, and verse 8, on the other hand. So let's take a look. Verse 7 on the one hand, verse 8 on the other hand. Verse 7 on the one hand. And regarding the angels, he says he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. On the other hand, but regarding the sun, he says your throne, God, is forever and ever. And the scepter of righteousness is the scepter of his righteousness. Now, in Psalm 104, with God, with God's authority over all the works, Psalm 104, verse 4. Psalm 104, verse 4, he makes the winds his messenger. That's what was said in verse in Hebrews. Flaming him, flaming him higher his ministers. Picture of restoration of the earth and the second and third heavens at the first, second and third days of creation. Restoration. And then in verse 8, verse 8, the mountains rose, the valley sank down to the place which he, which you establish for him, for them. Going up, coming down in the restoration of the seven days to restoration. And the angels watched all this restoration. Remember, they've already seen all of this. They've already seen this. So therefore, verse 9. You have loved righteousness. This is talking about this, the love of the Son. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. The hatred of the Son, the Son hates anything contrary to God while in, while, uh, in his rule. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy above your companions. His, he's, his son's anointed with joy. Now, let's take a few minutes here to talk. Twelve ways Jesus' name is more excellent. Twelve ways Jesus' name is more excellent. One. The name Jesus means Savior. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. She, Mary, she will be a, she will be, uh, she will be a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. For he himself will save his people from their sins. His name means Savior, Redeemer. Deliverer, preserver. Two, the name Jesus means Emmanuel. It means Savior. It means Emmanuel, which means God with us. <coughs> God with us. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son. And they, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. Three, the name Messiah. Messiah. This is called, but twice in the whole New Testament. In John 1, 41, by Andrew, the father of Peter. He found first his own brother, Simon. This is uh, talking about Andrew. And said, we have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ, the anointed one. The second time and the third and the only time 
The second time he is related <clears throat> as the Messiah was by the woman. And this is what's really interesting. Woman of Samaria. Now Samaria was a name used for the northern kingdom of Israel during the exile uh, 6th, 6th uh, century B.C., the Jews intermarried, and they came together and uh, built a home in Samaria, in Samaria, and we became known as Samaritans, who, by the way, despised. They were despised by the Jews. Now, in John 4, there was this Samaritan woman who, when she met Jesus, she identified Jesus as the Messiah, which is just astounding. John 4, 24, 5. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ. When the one comes, he will declare all things to us. So she knows quite a lot for a Gentile, uh, for actually a, a half-breed. Four. So that's the fourth. He is called the Christ. The Christ, which means the Anointed One. Now by Hamilton, of the theological work of the Old Testament, the word Christ has four significant significance in this name. Quick little significances. One, separation under God. He is called the Christ, the anointed one, which means one separated under God. Two, authorization by God. Three, divine enablement. And four, the big one, the coming deliverer. It is used to refer to a righteous, spirit-filled ruler, as in Isaiah chapter 9, 1 through 7, Isaiah 11, 1 through 5, Isaiah 61, 1, referring to the coming of Jesus Christ. Now I'll show you exactly how the Pharisees and the Sadducees had no respect for this Jesus as the Christ. Notice the command of God in regards to this Christ in the Word of God. Psalm 104. So let's turn turn to Psalm 105. Turn to Psalm 105. Verse 15, Psalm 105, verse 15. This is, listen now, do not touch my anointed ones. He is called Christ. He is called the Son of God, but he's called Christ. And now it says, do not touch my anointed one, and they want to crucify him. And do my prophets no harm. Verse 16, do not touch. Verse 16, do not touch my anointed ones. This is God speaking. And so what I'm showing you is how horrible things were at the time of Christ by the Jews. Do not touch my anointed ones. They were so concerned about not doing anything wrong on the Sabbath while they killed Jesus Christ. And do my prophets no harm. During the time it was ruled by king, by king, Israel especially applied the title to its ruler. Look at 2 Samuel 114. Look at 2 Samuel 114. Then 
David, so now we're thinking about David, said to him, how is it you were now, you were not afraid to stretch out your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Now, what this is, to put you in context, uh, the, 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 this uh, Gentile was, he's an uh, uh, Amalek, he is sent out to kill David and Saul. So this is what he's talking about. First, he was an Amalek, and secondly, he died for planning to kill him. God sets toward his son as his anointed one. Note Psalm 2. Psalm 2. Verse 2. Powerful verse. Psalm 2, powerful chapter. Psalm 2, verse 2. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, that's Yahweh the Father, and against his anointed. Against his anointed. That's Christ. So, again, another, uh, by God, you don't mess with the Lord, with the Christ. Now, very important, in the complete biblical library says, Israel's hope for salvation was placed upon a personal mediator who, as the Lord's chose, chose instrument, would save and redeem Israel in the end times. This is the way that have thought that they have thought and still think and still think the same way today. From the completed biblical biblical library, I want to read to you from the the uh, the one uh, paragraph. This is a paragraph in the entire. Uh, Temple, uh, a complete biblical library on this, at this subject matter. So let me give this to you. Psalm 2 describes from an eschatological perspective the struggle between the Almighty God and his enemies. The issue here is the final universal victory of God and his kingdom. Psalm 46, 46, Ezekiel 38, Revelation 20, verse 8 and following. In the course of this battle, the anointed one of the Lord, that's Christ, comes on the scene as the one who manifests the kingdom of God on earth. Verse 9, you shall break them with a rod of iron, you shall shatter them with Aaron, uh, with earthenware. The fate of all animal, of all peoples, despite upon their relationship with the anointed of the Lord. Verse 12. So the fate of, the, of all the peoples depend upon their relationship with the anointed. Verse 12. Do homage to, this is the reading in Psalm 2, in verse 12, do homage to the Son, that he not become angry, and you will perish in the way. For his wrath may soon kindle. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. He is installed as the Son of God in the theocratic, messianic sense of, of, the, of the term, and given universal dominion. Continue reading. The new aspect, which, which differs from former messianic expectations, is that the Messiah 
will have universal dominion. Furthermore, it is also obvious that the Messiah's accomplishment are in keeping with the will of the Lord himself for the establishment of his kingdom on earth. The Lord, the, the most complete picture of Messiah in the Old Testament, listen to this now, the most complete picture, if you take note, you want to take a note on this, the most complete picture of Messiah in the Old Testament is perhaps Psalm 72. So you'll want to study it. It provides an almost total summary of all the messianic prophecies of the Old Testament. That's astounding. When I worked on this in Psalm 72, I couldn't believe it. I thought, I'm going to have to spend another now just month doing that one. No, let's go on. This psalm is a prayer for God to send Israel a king from the lineage of David who will mirror God's own merciful intentions. It is a request for a righteous descendant of David, such as one's prophecy in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2 and following, 2 Samuel 23, 3 and following. The distinct feature of this psalm, Psalm 72, is that the Messiah King will gain follower, followers because he is mercy and love. Verses 8 through 14. May he also rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Verse, in fact, let me get this to you where I am. We are in now reading verse 8 through 14 of, uh, of our passage, Psalm 72. So let's read it now. Verse 8. May he also rule from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. Let the nomens of the desert bow before him and his enemies slick, lick the dust. Let the kings of Tarshish and the islands bring presents. The kings of Seba, of Seba and Seba, of Seba, Seba and Seba offer gifts. And let all kings bow down before him. All nations serve him, for he will deliver the needy when, in, when he cries for the help, the afflicted also, and him who has no helper. He will have compassion on the poor and needy, and he in the lives of the needy he will save. He will rescue their lives from oppression and violence, and their blood will be precious in his sight. He is a, he is a prince of peace who cares for the poor and the destitute. Fear of the Lord, let them fear you while soon, while the sun endures and as long as the moon throughout all generations righteousness and peace will endure give the king your judgments O God and your righteousness to the king's son may he, may he judge your people with righteousness and you are afflicted with justice. Let the mountains bring him peace to the people, and his and the hills and and hills in righteousness. 
Okay, now let's go to the fifth name. We've covered four names, now the fifth way. His name is the title Son of David. His name, his name is the title Son of David. Think of that from way he's, especially a, a Jew listening to this. The title Son of David indicates Jesus' <clears throat> physical descent from David as well as his membership of the Davidic line of kings. This sets up the claim, the claim of Jesus Christ to the Davidic throne based on the promises God made to King David. So, son of David. Six, the son of man. The son of man. This one is so important. Man refers to Adam in is the fulfillment of Jesus as the Son of God. Son of God refers to the divinity of Jesus. Son of man affirms his humanity. So the Son of man. Seven, name above all names. Name above all names. Hebrews chapter 2 Verse 9, Hebrews 2, 9. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. The Greek above is also used in the, in the uh, figurative in the sense of ex excelling or surpassing or that his name is beyond or much more than any other name. The eighth one. His name is the object of all worship. His name is the object of all worship. Philippians 2.4 Philippians 2.4 So that as the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Think about the idea of offering worship to Jesus by all people. To worship means to show reference, veneration, adoration, to bow and honor Jesus. The ninth one, his name is the reason prayers are answered. His name is the reason prayers are answered. Look at these passages. John 14. Let's look at it. John chapter 14, verse 13. John chapter 14, verse 13. And whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. See all this going on? You ask it in my name, I will do it. And why? That the Father will be glorified in my name. John 14, 14. So the next verse. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Also, let's look at 1 John 5, 14. Let's look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears it. And if we know that he hears us, excuse me, if we, that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. Okay, now we go to 10th, 10th level of his name. His name will provide the authority and ability 
to serve God. This refers to you and me. His name provides the authority and the ability to serve God. Matthew 7.22 Matthew 7.22 Many will say in my name, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? You perform many miracles in your name. Now, it's going to continue on where, no, I didn't know you. But the point is that they, by that name, they were hoping to do it. And we can do it in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay, the 11th. The 11th name. His name will be the object of man's faith. His name will be the object of man's faith for eternal salvation. For eternal salvation. John chapter 3, verse 18. John, 18, John 3, 18. The one who believes in me is not judged. The one who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. John 16 through 17 of John 3, John 3, 16 and 17 tell that God the Father loved so much that he sent his Son to self for salvation rather than coming to judge the world. Verse 318, verse 18, the one who believes in him is not judged. God is going to come and judge, but you don't have to. You do not have to. In 2 Peter chapter 3, 9, in 2 Peter 3, 9, God loves and therefore has patience to cause him to delay his judgment. Now, 13, 15 or 12 is the last one. 12 is the last one. His name will bring the Holy Spirit to teach, comfort, and lead. His name will bring the Holy Spirit to teach us, comfort, and lead. John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Verse 26. But the helper, or prayer kletos, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and remind you of all things that I've said. Okay. <clears throat> We're now at verse 5. So there are two main jaw topics in the first chapter of Hebrews. How Jesus is better than angels. How Jesus is better than angels. And secondly, Jesus is God. Two things in Hebrews chapter 1. All right. The deity of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 1, 5. So let's take a look. Hebrews 1, 5. For to which... Of the angels did he answer or did he say you are my son today I have gathered you I have fathered you <clears throat> and again I will be a father to you and he will be a son to me this declares Jesus to be the son of God and the only son of God now verse 6 Hebrews chapter 1 verse 6 and when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. Let all the angels of God worship him. This tells us that God commands all the angels to worship him. Verse 7, and regarding the angels, back to the angels, he says, 
He makes all angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire, declares the service of the angels to God. Now, verse 8. Now, verse 8. But regarding the sun, it's over the angels now, and regarding the sun, he says, your throne, God, defends him, defines him as God, is forever and ever. And the scepter of righteousness is the scepter of his kingdom. Here God refers to Jesus as God and declares the authority and kingship of Jesus Christ as God. Open your Bibles to John 5. John 5. Take a moment and look at verse 18 and following. Expresses the equality of Jesus Christ with the Father. All right, now listen. Verses 18 through 23 expresses the equality of Jesus Christ with God. Verse 18, equal in being. Being, B-E-I-N-G. And this, for this reason, therefore the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making him equal with God. Verse 19, he was equal in works. He was equal in in works. Verse 19. Therefore, Jesus answered him and was thus and saying to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he, he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Father does in like manner. So he does equal works. So first, he is equal being. 19, he is equal works. Now verse 20, he is equal in love and work. Jesus Christ is equal in love and works. Verse 20, for the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself is doing. And the Father will show him greater things than these so that he will be, he will be not marvel. Now, verse 21, equal in power. Verse 20, he is equal in love and work. Verse 21, equal in power. Verse 21, for just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. Verse 21, equal in authority. Verse 22, equal in authority. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. Given all judgment to the Son. And then verse 23, equal in honor equal in honor. Verse 23, so that all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. So that all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Now, Going back, continuing our work, we come now to his superiority as creator. Superiority as creator, verses 10 through 12. Verse 10, you go put your Bibles now to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, 
and the heavens are work of the works of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will wear out like a garment and like a robe. You will roll, you will roll them up like a garment. You, they will uh, be also be changed, but you are the same. And your ear, your years will not come to an end. Now, first note that Messiah is now dressed as Lord in verse 10 through 12. And then I want you to look at uh, Psalm 102. Look at Psalm 102, verse 25. Psalm 102, verse 25. We're covering a lot of the Bible today. Psalm 102, verse 25. In time of all, excuse me, in time of old, you founded the earth and the heavens are the work of your hand. Even they will perish, but you will endure. All of them will wear out like a garment, like clothing. You will change them and they will pass away. But you are the same and your ear, your ears will come, will not come to an end. Remember, what, what psalm was that again? That was Psalm 102. And what verse? Verse 25. Okay. Psalm 102, verse 25. In time of old, you founded the earth and the heavens, all the uh, works of your hands. Okay? Got it. All right? Good. Now, <coughs> Rod Merriman marked the contrast between the Creator and this creation. He did it this way. You've got on the left side of your, of your paper the Creator or the creation. And then on the right side, the Creator. The creation, the Creator. So here's the creation. <clears throat> they shall perish your, uh, yourself. They shall perish. But and then go to the Creator. But you yourself will keep on. Now, crea creation, not in the sense of cessation, but remaining <clears throat> of, of, the, of destruction so as to make way for the new heavens and the new earth. Now continue reading this on your left side. They will wear out like garment. Creator, but you yourself, but you yourself will, list, will roll forever. All right? Create, create the, the uh, contrast are, are the same. They will be changed by the by the new years, by the new years, um, on the new heavens and new earth. Now we got ten minutes left. We've got ten minutes, uh, ten verses, uh, verses 12, 12, 13 through fourteen, verses thirteen through fourteen. How the angels serve. How the angels serve. The Son of God was the Creator. The Son of God was victorious. Angels were the servant of Him. The question in verse 13 demanded a negative answer. But to which of the angels has He said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now, this quotation, Psalm 110, 
it was uh, Psalm 110 was my master paper in uh, Della Seminary. Psalm 110 is the most quoted in the Old Te in the New Testament. It is cited in proving the plurality of the Godhead and of Jesus Christ, supreme King, supreme Christ, supreme Man Messiah. It is emphasis, and it's emphasized that he was sitting at his right hand. Here, what we just read, sitting at his right hand. This was because his work was complete. Sitting down, his work is complete. The responsibilities in the work of redemption is now over. He was sitting at the right hand. The right hand is the place of dignity, exaltation, authority, prestige. He remains seated until the, sec the second advent, until I make your enemies your footstool, second advent. And verse 14, are they not? All ministers, ship, uh, spirits, sent out to provide service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. Answer, and angels are the servant of ministries of, Je of Jesus. And in closing, we have the privilege of serving the Lord. We have this privilege. So next week, Having be please read Psalm 2 so that you'll be ready for Psalm 2 in our work of three. Let's close in a word of prayer. You didn't think I did, did you? <laughs> close in a word of prayer. Oh, Father, we love your word. We love your word. We learn so much from it. Father, Sorry I had to go through this quickly. It should take years and years to do chapter one. We praise you, Father, for giving us this information about Jesus Christ as God, as creator, as our savior, and now our friend. Pray that you will edify these things to our soul. We pray these things in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.